Are you wearing a space suit? Because he's working with uh, the ingredients of the oral contraceptive, and uh, he doesn't want to uh, ingest any of it. He doesn't want to become feminized. Yeah, true. Right? I mean, there's there would be particles in the air there sure. uh, that would contain the uh, sure, you female can, hormone. You, know, you can you can like see the dust on that one. You know, everything that is made down here, they take precautions with to you know avoid uh, any accidents. You know, anybody ingesting any of the drugs, of course. Is it the most sort of drastic kinds of precautions? Well, uh, I wouldn't use the word drastic. It's, it, it's very, you know, it's very cautious. As you can see, the, you know, the outfits that they're wearing are, you know, they're just protected. They're, they have rubber gloves and they have their, you know, their own air supply on their back and so on. In working with, uh, with chemicals, you have to be very careful because a lot of chemicals are just dangerous. I wasn't supposed to be psychotic. I was a juvenile delinquent, and I ran away from home, and that's why I was locked up. At the beginning, I was given, like, 175 milligrams of Thorazine. I was just, like, totally knocked out for two days. Like, I didn't wake up at all for two days. You know? And, like, that was that was a very um, mind-blowing experience because it made me realize, like, they totally didn't know what they were doing at all, you know? I, I was really freaking out, and... All, all they did to me, you know, was dope me up with the, uh, with Thor's. I, they, they came in with, you know, a handful of five or six different colored pills. I was having some emotional problems at the time, some marital things, and I was stuffing my face. Now, that's what I should have attacked, but I didn't. And I went to this doctor, and he said, no, we put you on pills, diet pills. They just say, take the pills. They never, they know that I was pregnancy, I have my baby and everything. Um, but they, I told them, I don't like to be taking a lot of drugs. You give me a lot of medicine and I don't like, you have to. I had a problem, I was urinating frequently. And I decided to go see a urologist. And I went to see a doctor and he took a series of tests for my bladder. And it turned out that nothing, I didn't have any infection and there wasn't anything there. And after the test came in, I was in his office, and he told me there was no, there was nothing wrong, no infection, and asked me if I ever get nervous. And I said, yeah, I do get nervous once in a while, and I, sometimes I can't sleep at night. He said, would you like something for it? And I thought for a second, I thought, sure, okay. And he proceeded to write on a white slip of paper and handed it to me and said, goodbye. And I said, thank you, goodbye. And when I got out of the room, I looked at the piece of paper and it said Valium 5 milligram. And I went to the drugstore and I noticed at the drugstore under the refill it said 10. Like Valium is, I think, one of the most detrimental uh, drugs that can be issued to uh, any person who is suffering from a, a nervous condition. And it seemed to be so popular for so many doctors, for some reason or another, to give Valium, especially to women. When they reach a certain age, they feel like you've got some type of nervous problem, you put on Valium. I think physicians over-prescribe in general. Uh, everybody's well aware of the specifics like uh, penicillin for a cold, et cetera. In a situation where we've had patients that come in with uh, um, overdose of some form of drugs, and uh, we've got a contact with the family and say, okay, bring in whatever the patient was on. Just anything they were taking, even to the, down to the vitamins. And they came in with, with shoe boxes 
we've dumped the contents of these medications out and it would fill up a shoebox. And they were taking all different types of medications and two or three of these medications are from different doctors. We have patients sometimes on my ward that have 15, 16, 17 drugs ordered for them with, you know, I mean, the overlapping effects of them are, are something that the doctors don't know. And, but we'll physician out and he says he can't figure out what it is so he'll stop all the drugs then because he doesn't know what caused it. I mean he might know the effects of each individual drug but they don't know the effects when they're all combined like that. In my own experience in doing consulting work uh, if I'm asked to see a patient in consultation uh, most of the times the patient has been very well worked up certainly as well as I would have or maybe even better and no one still knows what's going on and I've just done nothing except stop one, two, or more of the drugs, and the patient miraculously seems to get better, and suddenly I'm a genius consultant. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with my knowledge, certainly. I came into that hospital as a new nurse with, you know, with a lot of ideals about why I was coming in there, and I have come to feel, in many ways, like I'm a drug pusher. You know, they talk about the big drug problem in this country, well, where it really exists is right here in the hospital. Every time a doctor orders a drug to be given to a patient, and I have to give it, I, I, can, I can feel standing over that patient or next to them that I have to do this, and I don't want to do it. I hate it because it's something that I don't believe in and I'm against, and here I am and I'm doing it. And I have to do it because um, I need money, because I need to, a job, because I need food in my mouth. And uh, I want to say to them, I'll spill it down the sink. You can be as hysterical as you want tonight. But, you know, I can't do that. Not in the system, not the way it's set up. Oftentimes, uh, without the patients even knowing it, they will, they will have sleeping medications and tranquilizers ordered for them when they, they, they've never taken them at home. And then sometimes, like, like we've, we've had older people who had um, sleeping medications ordered for them who've never taken them at home who get completely freaked out like after taking some of that and it, and it was given to them without their knowledge and and the nursing people feel compelled sometimes to give it to them because they're so overworked and they can't be dealing with people um, staying up all night in my experience the last couple of decades has seen enormous distance placed between patient and doctor through the mechanism of using a drug transaction rather than literally talking to the patient and I fear at times even examining the patient. It's easier to write a prescription and get rid of the patient than to sit down and explain the pathophysiology of what's really going on and why that drug, say an antibiotic, is totally unnecessary. What was very strange to me is I just had a surgery. Okay, I was in the hospital and I had an operation and uh, I went into some complications, you know, for about three months afterwards. When I spoke to the doctor and asked him to tell me exactly what was happening, he couldn't do that. He said, well, you know, what you're looking for is a cause and effect answer, you know, and I can't give you that because nobody knows that well how the human body works. Okay, now, if they don't understand how the human body works, then how can they understand that this pill, you know, are these pills? will have uh, an effect on the human body that's uh, not uh, affecting them the wrong way. I called an ophthalmologist and I said, look, something is wrong. I can't see out of one eye. It didn't look any different. So he called me into St. Mary's Hospital and took a look at my eye and said, my God, you've got a blood clot. You aren't going anywhere and threw me into the hospital where I stayed for five days, during which time they x-rayed me and gave me blood tests and shots in the stomach. And all this time I'm feeling physically the same way I've always felt, but rather upset emotionally because I didn't know what was going on. I mean, blood clots move, right? Thought it might hit my brain or something. So at the end of five days, they could not tell me what was wrong with me. They couldn't find anything wrong with me. The only thing that came out was that I've been taking birth control pills for about five years and it so happened that in the press that very week there was this linkage between blood clotting and birth control pills but when I brought this up to the doctors all they would say was yes 
it's true there is a connection but in this case there is no proof even though there's nothing wrong with you and you've been taking birth control pills we cannot write it down not even as a possibility you know i said well seems like it, there's something going on something made this thing happen and they just they didn't want to write anything down um, what's your sense about the doctors and the drugs they don't know anything about them i mean a lot of the times uh they would say well what do you think we should put this person on well we can try some stelazine and some thorazine and some halval i mean i've seen people on all three or four drugs at a time and so that when side effects begin they really don't know which drug it is that's starting it um they they don't know what dose to do so they'll go and run to the pdr and see what the recommended beginning dose is the doctor said well we won't uh put you back on all your medication, we'll just give you Stelazine, 10 milligrams of Stelazine. So uh, my sister was working at Santa Clara Kaiser Hospital and I got the physician's desk reference from her and looked up all the counterindications and memorized them and told the doctor uh, I'm experiencing these things. I don't know what they all were, but dry mouth, and seeing stars turning around and all this. And he, uh, so you didn't know anything about that. Uh, <laughs> didn't see any connection. Doctors get either a six-month or one-year course in pharmacology, and that's it. And what that means is that they're getting a few weeks on each category of drugs, a few weeks on heart drugs, a few weeks on psychoactive drugs, a few weeks on uh, gastrointestinal drugs, a few weeks on antibiotic drugs. And what that means is that's all the basic knowledge that they have when they step out of medical school. And beyond that, there's no real intense training for doctors in what, I, in what is called iatrogenic disease. That is doctor-induced disease. And the main way now in which doctors cause disease in patients is by drugs. They gave me medication, um, two different kinds of medication, one an anticoagulant, and I don't remember what the other one was. But whatever the other one was, about two weeks later, I woke up one morning, I'm out of the hospital, and I wake up, and my stomach is killing me. And I called the doctor, and he finally, I got him to come to the house, because I was freaking out. And he comes over, and, and he says, oh, yes, it seems like you might have an ulcer. And you probably got the ulcer from this medication. So I said, well, doctor, why didn't you say something? I mean, if, so if something's going to give you an ulcer, then there must be a special diet. And he said, yeah, that's true. There's a special diet, of course, but there's no history of ulcers in your, in your medical past. So um, I just didn't bother. It's a great concern in our society about the role of the doctor as a cause of disease. And no doubt that at the top of the list of these causes is the use of medications of potent variety uh, promiscuously often and certainly to excess in many cases. Doctors and or the medical profession have a feeling that they have to do something. You know, there's that whole myth that surrounds medicine and doctors, that doctors perpetuate, that people or patients perpetuate themselves too, that they want someone to help them. So what I think America has done is just put these doctors, this, they're, they're magic men and they write a prescription out and they're in a hurry and you've got 10 minutes for this or 15 minutes for that and they write the prescription they tell you and they go and you say well wait a minute doctor and they're off i'll follow them if i have to because i will be this way boy and i'll say wait a minute what is this i want to know what this prescription is what does it do what is the name of this i can't read your writing i'm sorry doctor i'll be polite but i'll ask him what does this say what does it do what is it for I think you have the right to know what your prescription is. And they don't tell you what it is. They write it out and you can't read it, you know. They make it like it's some sort of a great mystery, like they're alchemists, that they are working up gold for your body. And a lot of times they're not. They're putting lead in your ass, I know. There are problems in the use of drugs by the physician. There are, many drugs are overused, many drugs are improperly used. The cost is excessive, and the origin with a multi-billion dollar industry, with an industry uh, which is making enough money that it is profitable to distort the physician's thinking uh, by a concerted and misleading advertising uh, approach. Uh, the way to, to think of this is to ask, what is the source of information for the physician about drugs. 
If we ask this for, uh, for surgical techniques, you certainly wouldn't anticipate that the manufacturers of, of surgical instruments would be instructing the surgeon in the technique of an operation. But in medicine today, we have the manufacturers of the drug being the primary source of information about drug use. Why is it necessary for somebody who's employed by a company that's selling products to be doing this? Why shouldn't that function be performed by medical schools or other health agencies? It can be done by many different people, but in fact, nobody knows more about that company's product than the company itself. The one that has done all of the research for it and the investigation and the production solved the production problems. There's no one that knows more about it. Now they obviously have a vested interest uh, in, at best, giving incomplete information, pushing their own product, and at worst, giving deliberately distorted information to push their own product. Uh, the techniques by which they do this are ordinary uh, journal advertising in, in, the, in the medical journals, by direct mail advertising, and by taking over the function of postdoctoral instruction for the physician. But we are not the only source of information to physicians. The medical schools, their medical societies, the postgraduate seminars, to say nothing of journal articles and other sources of information are easily accessible to a physician and do give him quite a bit of information about these products. I think uh, training and education in pharmacology is seriously neglected in the course of medical training. But the gap is filled by uh, uh, the same kinds of uh, commercial foolishness uh, for doctors that the public gets. The same publication that publishes an article warning a doctor against uh, the dangers of using chloromycetin, which causes aplastic anemia, it has uh, big ads for chloromycetin, which is pushing it, so uh, the doctor reads the ads and not the article. The ordinary physician receives uh, huge numbers of unsolicited quote, medical journals every month. These so-called controlled circulation journals uh, are attractively uh, printed. Uh, money is no, no concern. Uh, so these are effective, but in a misleading way. They are, they are entirely supported by the industry, and they have become, al along with the other pernicious influence, the detail man, have become the primary source of information for the physician. The role of the detail man really is four roles. First of all, as his name implies, he gives details about his company's products to the health professional, how they should be prescribed as well as how they should not be prescribed. And second, he acts as a communicator back to his company of the physician's experience with the products and relays any questions that the physician may have that are not immediately answerable and in fact puts the physician in touch with MDs back at the plant so to speak, so that uh, he can get immediate answers. A physician can't ask a, a journal article a question, but he can ask a detail man a question and get an immediate answer. Third role that the detail man has is as a service representative, particularly to pharmacists. For instance, he may check the pharmacist's stock to see if any of his company's products have passed their expiration date, and then he replaces those without any charge to the pharmacist, I should point out. The fourth role is as a trainer in hospital settings particularly. Many detail men run training courses for health professionals who use companies' products such as diagnostics or intravenous injections to be sure that the material is properly used. So in general, there are four roles. The detail man, it must be said, is almost by definition a nice, affable, attractive person. He's chosen for skills as a salesman. I applied for a job with a major drug manufacturer in 1973. And basically I went through three interviews with these people. And more or less the main thing that came through was my job was to bring to light to these doctors and wholesale manufacturers uh, new drugs and what they would do. And basically another aspect was to get them to like me. So they would be writing their our drugs on their prescriptions rather than some other companies. I practiced uh, medicine in the private sector for over 20 years and grew to know many of them. Their goal, of course, is to increase the sale of their variety of products in that district, just as the man who sells cars or any other product has that same object. The guy used to come up and he'd want to know which of the half staff and which of the attending physicians were not using the products from his company. 
and uh, and they'd get their names and he'd get in touch with them. And I've seen him talk with some of the doctors and he'd come over and say, hey, how come you're not, how come you're using that stuff? The personality fact, the ability to go in there and really talk to a doctor on his level was an important thing. Our detail men have a little bit of a different approach. They uh, provide the vitamins for the whole staff for a year. And um, they're just like a part of the floor. I mean, they're there frequently. They know everyone's name. We know their name. It was our, our problem to go out there and get these doctors to like us and to therefore write prescriptions with our drugs. The primary purpose of a detail man is to remind the doctor about your product. Well, I think that one of our primary roles is, you know, is to sell. I shouldn't say primary role. Our primary role is to bring the information to them. And if we bring the information properly, hopefully the physician will remember to use the product. Our company and other companies have representatives who work specifically with medical schools. A lot of students don't like drug companies. <laughs> Philosophies come out of different schools. We try to respect that. I mean, uh, that's going to happen. But we like to think we have some educational aids they can use. It has nothing to do with our product, just to help them. You know, you'd like to have them think about your product when they finally get out there and go into a doctor's office. Some of them will and some of them won't, but we take the chance. You know. Hopefully they'll remember us. The detail man that I mentioned is under even less discipline uh, because uh, no one is there to uh, uh, to record and, and object uh, to what he says. The detail man is undisciplined because you can't, unlike an advertisement, you can't present the printed material of the regulatory agency and say, make them stop lying. There's no way to stop a detail man from shading the information he presents. I was almost to, almost to lie. In other words, uh, that I was going to tell these doctors who are directly responsible for people's lives that uh, these drugs were cure-alls, when in fact that, you know, they did have bad side effects, but that was supposed to be toned down. And there was a, a kind of a period of uneasiness talking to these people, trying to impress them that uh, I could do their job, and yet uh, wondering if when I did have the job, if uh, I would really want to pull the wool over some person's eyes and thus, you know, possibly kill someone in actuality. Because uh, from what I've read in the papers, doctors are prescribing medicines quite often that do in fact kill people. A drug was developed that uh, was supposed to lower the amount of fat, the, the amount of lipids in the blood and when it was used in humans, it caused cataracts and had to be withdrawn from use. Now, when this was investigated retrospectively, it became apparent that a vice president and two pharmacologists of the drug house involved, Merrill, uh, had withheld data. And that it was not unexpected that these humans developed cataracts because this had been observed in, in rats. Now, these three people were tried in a criminal court uh, pled guilty and were sentenced. One of these men is now the, uh, a full professor of pharmacology in a medical school of a university. There's no way of knowing what influence the drug company, which happens to be located in the same city in which this man now teaches, there's no way of knowing what influence they exerted. I spent close to a year working with a group that was doing research on the pill in Washington, D.C. at the time of the um, Senate congressional hearings on the pill. And the evidence that came to light showed a number of things of interest. The birth control pill was first tested on a group of 126 women in Puerto Rico. Most of them did not know that the drug they were taking was an untested or a new drug. When there were two deaths among these women who were young women, one I think was 22 and one 26, but I'm, I'm not positive about that, young women, that information was suppressed, effectively suppressed for years, actually. Only under a lot of pressure from the senators that held these hearings and, and the woman that did the research did that information come to light. In addition to that, many side effects that are now coming to light were never even... The studies were not set up to even discover those kinds of things, even though they knew, they knew which body systems they were dealing with, which they were interfering with, and yet they never set up control studies to watch the system, the reproductive system, the cardiovascular system, 
That's where all the blood clots come from. And when information slowly came to light, they refused to let it out. I was about 30 years old, and I was an ambitious young uh, doctor working in academic medicine, moving from instructor to assistant professor up the hierarchy of achievement and career. And the opportunity presented itself at the time to study uh, Raoulpia serpentina, Serpacil, and Raouloid, which were new drugs for the treatment of mental illness. So I got hold of the companies, and they gave us some free drugs. And from then on, uh, my reputation increased as a uh, researcher in clinical pharmacology. So between uh, 1954 and 1966, I did uh, 28 uh, new drug studies for about uh, 19 different uh, pharmaceutical companies. I became suspicious about uh, what I was doing in the drug industry about 1965 when I discovered a drug named Dornwall that had been sent to me by Wallace and Tiernan. And I tested it and I discovered that they hadn't uh, turned the reports I'd sent on this drug uh, into the FDA. Then I uh, checked with the FDA and I discovered that only a third of the 27 new drug reports that I'd done for these 19 companies had ever been filed with the FDA, which was, uh, you know, an incredible experience. I brought this matter to the attention of the Gaylord Nelson Committee of the U.S. Senate, and uh, I began to worry about some other things at that time. I began to worry about the fact that uh, Investigators uh, isolated in the university in one part of the country never know about a new drug, what other investigators are finding, because there's no communication. Each investigator is sworn to secrecy about the product he's using because of uh, patent considerations. So uh, it could be that uh, two people or uh, three were getting toxic symptoms that they couldn't put together, but if they'd been in communication, they could. This began to worry me. While we were studying the birth control pills in Washington, what we began to see was the connection between the suppression of information and the vast array of marketing techniques used by the drug industry to ensure the sale of their product. Now to get to the other part of your question as to why the detail man should try to persuade the physician to prescribe his company's product rather than another's, you made the statement that a, a similar or a same product. Well, that's the whole point. They're not the same. Formulations for products using the same drug vary from company to company. They're not standardized. And so each company's product can have different characteristics. They admitted to me directly that their products are just about the same as any other. Some a little bit better, some not so good. So how can they justify selling them as better? Uh, their justification, I think, is only to make their company more successful to make their paychecks fatter. There aren't that many new products coming down the line anymore. They're usually the same product over and over again. There are minor changes on some of these products, but basically the same. American drug industry has not contributed much that is new. The important, genuinely new advances have come from European industry, European and American universities. The American drug industry research effort has been devoted to preparing imitative compounds to looking at a market established by some genuinely new drug, some genuinely new advance, and fragmenting that market by making an imitative uh, compound. I'm struck by the duplication and reduplication by every single company and the obvious financial uh, hassling and detail men and, uh, you know, 40,000 kinds of phenobarbital and another. You know, it, it, it just gets ridiculous with uh, twisting the molecule to make the same thing. Take a thiazide diuretic is a thiazide diuretic. And I'm sure every drug company that I can think of has at least one or has one in combination with multiple other things. Now one technique that is used to maintain the special position of the very large manufacturers that can invest huge amounts of money in advertising is to fight what is known as generic name prescribing. Could you comment on the controversy where many people advocate that physicians only prescribe drugs by their generic and not by their brand name? Well, you see the problem with a generic prescription is that it leaves the choice of the product dispensed to chance. Our advice to consumers is to discuss it with a physician, ask the physician to write the prescription specifying the product of a quality manufacturer. Many of these drugs are, are available to anyone. That is, anyone can make and market them. 
they're no longer protected by a patent. But now we're told that only certain manufacturers can, can prepare drugs properly and that you must buy only from the largest and most heavily advertising companies. Now, as, a, as you know, these commodities are very, very strictly regulated as far as uh, uh, quantity and quality are, uh, uh, are concerned. So that it is simply not true that drugs are, are allowed to vary widely uh, in their properties between different manufacturers. The cost to the patient can be substantially less if uh, you can uh, encourage your doctor to use generic prescribing rather than brand name. If people order drugs by the generic name rather than by the trade name, the price is much less because you don't have to pay for the advertising and the other efforts that the company makes to distort the physician's thinking. For example, Darvon is a very popular drug. Uh, Darvon compound, uh, ordered generically, costs $13.60 a thousand. Ordered under its trade name, it costs $63.40 a thousand. Why do certain prescription pharmaceutical firms produce over-the-counter drugs? Because there is a market for them, and uh, they have divisions of their companies that are geared up to produce those products. Other companies uh, stay only within the prescription market. The whole subject of over-the-counter drugs is uh, very interesting, to say the least. It's such a political, economic uh, chaos. As a, I can't think of any other word for it. Also, the fact that the supposedly reputable drug companies are the ones that are putting out the over-the-counter drugs. So they've got the market no matter how you do it. And with advertising, especially on television, people are literally inundated with uh, quick cure for anything from uh, the common cold to hemorrhoids. Jack, you look like you had a hard day at the office. Yeah, yeah. You must have one of those tension headaches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are neuritis and neuralgia getting you down? You know, you're right. You know what this calls for? Mm -hmm. Alka-Seltzer Gold. Mm -hmm. That pure anti-acid drink we have all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. it gets rid of this headache feeling, you know? And it helps my upset stomach. You're right, Dad. Mm -hmm. And it's the fastest known remedy. And Mary, you're... The sinus is all stuffed up again, huh? She doesn't have to worry because you brought home a big family-sized bottle of Tristan just for her. Oh, wonderful. It'll be just the thing for my runny nose, too. Right, right. But you better watch out, Betsy. You're going to get indigested if you keep eating like that. I'm not worried. I got lots of tongue left over from yesterday. Right, right. Mom, mm -hmm. you sure look tired. I am. I have all the signs of tired blood. But I should be fine as soon as I have my Geritol with fortified iron. Oh. One of the issues that concerned me was why people are brainwashed to use uh, drugs. And uh, what we did was uh, three medical students and myself watched a solid week of uh, television on a commercial network television station in Detroit. We watched 130 hours. It was a fantastic experience, and what we discovered was, was very interesting. About 7% of all the content of a week of television is concerned with health. This means there's 344 commercials about drugs during that week, amongst other things. It also means that there's about 150 um, pro-drug statements and about 10 anti-drug statements. So something like uh, 10 or 15 times as many uh, drug-pushing messages to everyone that uh, warns people of uh, hazards in using drugs. But the most serious issue, I think, is the fact that 70% uh, of the health content of television is misleading or inaccurate or both. And this simply means from the cradle to the grave uh, people are exposed to uh, damaging uh, and uh, misleading information about their own health. We live in like a pill society, okay? You take a pill to get up, you take a pill to go to bed, you take a pill to walk, you take a pill to talk. 
okay, and, and it's breeding. The same kind of drug addiction that we're supposedly fighting, the whole system is supposed to be fighting, it's breeding it. You know, it's interesting that there's been a tremendous increase in the use of over-the-counter and prescription drugs by millions of Americans, and at the same time, the drug companies have some of the highest profit rates in the world. Critics have charged that the pharmaceutical industry uh, is making an excessive profit rate. Could you please comment on that? I think my first question would be excessive to what? Because actually our profit rate is comparable to other manufacturing industries and is, a matter of fact, less than some of them. The motive of the drug industry, avowedly, is the sale of their product and the making of profits from this process. That is the driving force. And I think it's fair to say that drug companies are quite candid about this. You know, any American industry has to have a good profit in order to attract capital. That's the purpose of it. And since the pharmaceutical industry is considerably riskier than some industries, for instance, only one out of every 8,000 products that's tested ever makes it to the pharmacy shelf, if there isn't the promise of a good profit, you're not going to attract the type of capital that will allow you to invest in your plants to expand uh, that type of thing without having to borrow outside and our industry is notable for that regard we simply do not borrow money outside all of our development comes from our own income this method of, uh, of stimulating activity may have some merit in other sectors of the economy there are many people who feel that profit rewards stimulate efficiency and so forth but it seems to me self-evident that it's counterproductive in this situation. It invites the uh, excess use of medication, the use of high-cost drugs when low-cost will work, the use of, of more potent drugs when, these, uh, when uh, a lesser, less threatening drug will, will work. It has stimulated the vast shift of the population into medication as a solution to problems that should be solved by other ways, human ways. What the end result of this is, is that the industry looks like the major drug dealers, if we were going to analogize it to the illegal drug trade, and the doctors, in effect, become the drug pushers. They're the ones who actually hand over the drugs to the patient with the prescription. And that's the, ro that's the role that they've been objectively put in, and they appear to be willing partners in that kind of collusion. And that has got to stop. And the only way that's going to stop is with a tremendous uproar at that kind of outrage from the people in this country and from concerned health people who recognize that that is going on and want to put a stop to it. It seems to me that the patients increasingly have to ask a doctor every time they get a medication, what's in it, what will it do, what are the risks, is this trip necessary? I think this alone will cause doctors to show more restraint in their drug uh, prescribing practices. Starting at the most basic level, I think the drug detail men should be banned from the hospital. I think that we shouldn't be using the PDR, the physician's desk reference, as your basic source of information about drugs. Um, I think doctors in medical schools should get more education about drugs. Nurses in nursing schools should get more education. I think there are a number of things that can be done. First of all, the regulation of this commodity can be extended, as it is in the case of public utilities, to the economics of the drug industry as well as the quality of its product. So that there can be governmental control of prices and prescribing practices as well as of the quality of the product. And we have to think of ways of regulating that industry beyond the, the vast array of federal regulatory stuff we have today, which doesn't get to the heart of the problem. I think the most effective way of changing people's viewpoints and, and basic attitudes about drugs is to change the uh, structure in which we live. In other words, I'm saying the way you change attitudes is not to work on attitudes, it's to nationalize the drug industry, take drug advertising off, and then you will develop a new consciousness. And to solve it, you have to figure out a way to get the health industry out of the realm of profit making, out of the realm of big business. And that's very hard to do. I think you, you do that by large groups of people coming together and acknowledging that that is the problem and demanding in a variety of ways that that not be allowed to be true anymore. We're actually talking about redoing the whole system from the top to the bottom or maybe from the bottom to the top, which will make it even harder. We're going to have to use the nobodies, the laymen, the people inside the country instead of the government establishment to push these things to happen. That's going to be kind of hard because as soon as you tell the doctors and the pharmacists that these drugs don't work anymore, <laughs> they lose a great deal of money.
you know, mm -hmm. a great deal of money, and they aren't going to just give it up. 